Yeah. Yeah. That's like a fun story. That's a fun story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we are we are now officially live. Okay, here we go. Alright. Alright, so uh welcome to everybody just came in. Uh we had a bit of a tech difficulty there. Uh you can see a little spoiler alert from the beginning. Uh as a reminder again, this is a spoiler free zone, but we had a minor tech problem where I didn't hit the stream button. Uh haven't done this for a while, but uh those who are joining us, welcome. Um we have uh, played a little late today just to get everyone a chance to come in. So this is all intentional. Uh, but for those who normally watch this stream, uh, we have two very special guests today. We have Justin Ma and GTN. We're going to flip over to the live screen right now. So there we go. Um, this is a bit of background. We spent the last you know, 20 minutes talking about archery and coffee and stuff. So um, we've, we've practiced, we've warmed up now. Um, and we've also spent time talking about Dynasty Warriors and uh, our little experiment in shooting uh, four or five arrows at once, which I guess, I guess Justin will say, uh, don't recommend. <laughs> it works. It works. All right. Let's, let's do a, a check here. Um, do we have sound and do we have picture? Okay, let's have a look here. Um, I'll wait for chat to come in here. Okay, video seems on. Yep. So I've got the placeholder and we've just flipped over. Now for this, th those who are watching, uh, there is a slight uh, delay in terms of uh, a few seconds. So I think we should be running up here now. Uh, can, can chat, can we confirm? Uh, firstly, sound and visual. I'm getting a few yeses in chat right now. Yes. Uh, we've got a few people today. We've got people coming from Austria, I believe. We've got people from Canada. Uh, and things are good. Green, green, and green. Thank you, everybody, by the way. At the moment, we have uh, about 32 people watching, and that's myself talking. Um, I've, I've told G and uh, Justin to not put the stream up. I have to stream because I have to have the stream up, but there's a bit of inception going on. I'm seeing myself, hearing myself, and it's getting a little weird for me. So I'm going to uh, turn my stream off for now. But uh, we're all watching. So, okay, so uh, now that we're here, uh, everything is good. All right, so uh, welcome uh, to everybody again. Uh, those who are coming in, very happy to see that we're here. And of course, you have Justin and G. So without um, further ado, I'll let Justin and G introduce themselves, and then we'll go through a few questions which we gathered from the uh, the viewers. So uh, Justin and G, would you like to uh, uh, repeat the introductions? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Justin Ma. I'm a software engineer, and uh, my pastime is researching and reconstructing traditional Chinese military archery um, teaching as well as reselling equipment, um, Asiatic bows, quivers, rings, uh, through the Cinnabar book. And, and I uh, co-authored uh, the book, The Way of Archery, with uh, Jia Tian over here. Uh, hi, I'm Jia, and uh, I'm also the co-author of the book. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is a book. Um, I'm also the co-author of the book, and also I'm a practitioner of uh, Chinese archery. And, uh, it's been eight years, right? Almost yeah. eight years. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what a journey. And, uh, you know, with Justin. And, uh, you know, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of journeys, uh, tell us about how you got into uh, traditional Chinese archery. Hmm. Well, um, on my end, I used to be a contemporary wushu practitioner. So contemporary Chinese wushu. And, um, you know, I took a hiatus from it for a while. And then one day in mid-2009, I encountered a little online quiz that said, what weapon are you? And I was like, hmm, well, I'll take that quiz. And I ended up getting bow and arrow as the result. The thing is, I didn't practice archery at all. So I was like, well, maybe that's something I should get into. It seems like a good idea. But it would be nice to do something with a bit of a Chinese flavor to it as well. So I had my mind set on practicing uh, traditional Chinese archery, but I didn't have too many resources available at the time. Uh, but there were valuable resources such as uh, Kay's Book of Thumb Rings, uh, Stephen Selby's Chinese Archery. That's a really good book to buy as well. And I would study those. Um, and at first I started with three months of Western Barebow Recurve. And that was part of an introductory class that was taught by a former, actually a former US Olympic team coach. But he kind of, um, 
didn't have the most positive opinion about traditional archery, so I kind of kept my sort of ultimate goal quiet. And then after that uh, three months, I kind of started exploring uh, traditional Chinese archery on my own, you know, buying one of those cheap fiberglass bows from eBay, trying things, bows too heavy, you know, going back to bows that are lighter and uh, doing a lot of sort of DIY exploration. And then eventually in 2011, um, I met uh, Jia Tian. We were actually introduced by a mutual friend. If people know Alibo, John Lee, John Lee, that he introduced us. So, yeah. So, yeah. What about what about your origin story? Yeah, for me, and uh, you know, when I was uh, back in college, I kind of wanted to do something, you know, uh, related to Chinese culture. And uh, you know, I was uh, doing uh, searching. I think I remember like a uh, Google searching, and uh, you know. For some reason, weird reason, like you know, archery popped up, and <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe I should uh, like you know do some research on it, and uh, that's pretty much how I started, and from that 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 day, like uh, all the way here. So. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course you've been involved in uh, doing um, your own Chinese archery programs. Can you tell us more about what you do? Yeah, so the Chinese archery program is an annual. Um, retreat. Think of it as a, 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 a very exclusive archery retreat in southeast uh, rural Georgia in the United States. Um, and it's held at Yap and K. Copa Dryer's bamboo farm. So Yap and K. Copa Dryer, they've been involved in Asiatic archery for many years, like yeah. since... Um, 70s, right? Uh, yeah, like since the 70s, 80s. And mm -hmm. um, like they're especially, like Yap is one of the earliest people to start the reconstruction of hornbows in the modern era. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he uh, and Kay is, is a very uh, prominent writer in the traditional archery, traditional Asiatic archery circles. So, um, yeah, both of them, they own a bamboo farm in Georgia, and it's a lovely place with like groves of giant trees, bamboo farms, like, and museum quality collections of bows. And so that was, um, you know, originally it just started in 2013. They said, you know, we're going to let's, let's hold this Chinese archery program. And, we were one of just a handful of people that came over, uh, thought it would be a nice, good idea. And then sort of after they saw us shoot, yeah. like, uh, you know, he, he saw Jada and I shooting. He's like, you guys should be the instructors here. And uh, so, you know, we then, since then, we've of course co-organized co each of the Chinese archery programs since then. Yeah. 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 And uh, we just finished our seventh. Yeah. Yeah. The 2019, we've gone through our seventh iteration of it. That's and we're starting our planning for the eighth iteration again uh, in March, in twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we just have the, the smoothest transition to the ad that you're playing on the screen right now. And I've uh, I've noticed quite a few things too. Like you see that it's more dynamic shooting, so you're shooting while walking, and there's like well, what what kind of things do you do in the program itself? Well, the program itself. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to swear. Oh, we have like um, multiple, multiple like uh, you know uh, things to do. Like you know, um, one thing is like a ritual uh, archery. Like you know, we kind of just follow like the you know the, the old like a old fashioned way like uh, doing the ritual archery, and also like you know a kind of minority like a actual game and uh, and uh, yeah. yeah. Both of those are team matches, like team one team matches. against the other. That's right. And cause those are good tests of concentration and. and uh, uh, shooting under pressure, and right. we also do a lot of fundamental form work. You know, uh, shooting at the gaojin, yep. you know, which is just a form practice fail. You stand, you know, two two meters away, three meters away, and you just focus on your form first. Yep. Uh, and then also we have uh, different modules where we teach different aspects of form. You know, what do you do with your shoulders? What do you do with your posture? Uh, timing. Um, you know, long distance shooting, all kinds of different things. Like and moving and, targets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we added more things like moving targets, um, mobility, those kinds of those kinds of things. That's right. That's amazing. Yeah, and uh, thanks for the ad too. That was a very nice uh, visual reference for those who are fortunate to be watching at home. Uh, very uh, good um, preview of the program, and I think quite a few of the people in chat are actually uh, alumni from the program as well. Okay. So. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of positive reviews and recommendations. So, 
Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, moving through our next uh, question, which I completely forgotten. Um, so uh, we've sp spoken a lot about Chinese archery. I think it's time to for those who are watching who aren't familiar with the topic to give a bit of an overview about what Chinese archery is. So uh, this is obviously your expertise. Um, tell, tell us about Chinese archery. What is it, and how it's different from uh, other archery styles? Sure. Um, that this is a. Uh... This is a little bit of a, a nuanced answer to the question because um, when we say Chinese archery, it's not just a simple little package like this is Chinese archery, you know, and it's the same stamp, you know, wherever you go, uh, or the same template wherever you go. So what I what we would say is Chinese archery um, encompasses the culture, the history, and the techniques associated with the practice of archery uh, in China throughout its history and its geography. And you know, China with its multi-thousand year history, very large land area, you're going to get a lot of diversity in terms of artifacts, bow types used, um, techniques practice, and, and things change throughout history as well in terms of the trends there. So saying that Chinese archery is just this type of bow or shooting with this type of technique is a little, is way too much of a simplification. Um, so, but what we can say is that archery was very important to Chinese people and to Chinese culture, because uh, there are a lot of found origin stories that involve archery. Like there's the uh, Ho Yi shooting the Ten Sons. Yeah. Like that's a creation myth that's very fundamental to Chinese folklore. Um, there are, um, and a lot of founding emperors of dynasties would be described as great archers, you know, in addition to other leadership qualities. Um, the bow is considered the premier weapon for the military. And then also the um, military exams. They would test officers and generals on. Archery is a major part of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Because um, yeah, they would test them on strategy. They would also test them on archery because archery was sufficiently complex that you could successfully like execute that, and you could, you know, teach you know, tactics to your soldiers. So it yeah. was very useful in battlefield. Definitely long range weapon. Definitely, definitely. You know the um, archery. So archery on chariot was something that happened in the first millennia BC, yeah. I would say. And then, you know, after that, actually in the fourth century BC, uh, horse archery started being introduced into the Chinese sphere as well. You know, one of the one of the seven states, this is one of the periods of Chinese history where China was actually divided into seven warring states. states. And one of them was like, you know, maybe we should adopt some of these tactics from the the the, yeah. Was it the Shilmu people? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know that and that sort of started, you know, the the escalation in tactics, and um, you see that sort of um, developing through the following centuries. Actually, the first evidence of paired stirrups you know, was uh, from the Jin Dynasty. That's the dynasty that takes place just after the Three Kingdoms period, and that tells you how entrenched um, horse archery become becomes in Chinese culture. And this is around, I want to say, the third or fourth century AD. Yeah, around that. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 um integral part of Chinese culture, uh, in many aspects. I could go on. I mean, you know, Confucius was an archery teacher. That's right. Like that's that's huge, right? Now, you know, some people know that, or maybe when I bring it up, they're like, oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> there's 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 that anecdote. Um, and then Taoism features various anecdotes that feature archery as well. That's so right. it's all over the place. Yep. But um, it's one of those things where tragically in the 20th century, because of a uh, lot, well, yeah, firearms. Well, yeah, well, not even, well, firearms, I guess, they were introduced in well. the like early part of the second millennium AD. Yeah. Like, you know, Yuan Dynasty, Ming, Ming Dynasty, Ming the Dynasty, firearms were being yeah. used, but they weren't, archery wasn't completely out of the picture. Oh, yet. yeah. But um, in the 20th century, with like, Super advanced firearms, yeah, and archery kind of just kind of goes by the wayside. <laughs> um, political upheaval in China kind of makes things, you know, when you're trying to survive revolutions, like of the like, end of a dynasty or a, a you know a political civil war in the middle of the century or like a cultural revolution and mm -hmm. things like that, like preserving archery is kind of lower down on the priority list. Yeah. I think survival is just a little, a little bit higher. <laughs> so. Um, there was kind of like an interruption in terms of the practice of Chinese archery. But now, you know, we're well into the 21st century right. and there's a lot of revive, uh, interest in reviving the practice of Chinese archery because people realize like th this was an important part 
of Chinese culture, and um, we want to be able to. Uh, and not only like that, around the world, but also in China mainland, like a lot of people are doing that. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Now uh, that kind of segues on to uh, Gao Ying. So, how does Gao Ying come into the uh, the quite the uh, the picture? Ooh. Well, um, that I would say I would say it's around 2012. Yeah. Like I, we, yeah, we got our hands on um, Gao Ying's band. It's too early. Like uh, I think it was 2011. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. That's that. right. Yeah, just sort of like you know, just sort of browsing it on the side, right. and yeah. um, you, you know, know, we we've been like uh, you know. Uh, doing research on like, all these kind of ancient like uh, books for a while, like you know, Gaoling can, Gaoling's book can be like one of the most uh, you know detailed and uh, you know book like uh, you know out there. So that's why we decided to to like you know uh, dig into it. And also like you know um, now after like you know doing research and everything, I and mean, it works. So yeah, yeah. I mean to give you context, right? Like let's say that um, most manuals are archery. Are usually segments of larger compendiums, but the archery segments are usually, say, like this, this long. Mm -hmm. And then Gauding's manual is like, yeah. like it was much more detailed. That's right. Uh, so like one of his contributions um, is that it's like it's a very, um, it's a very detailed manual that gives a lot of explanations to various aspects of technique. Yep. Um, and so much so that the, like it was actually sort of transmitted to other places as well, like Japan, and Korea. Yeah, yeah. So, you can still find like a Ming Dynasty like edition, like a Gaoling's book, like in Japanese like a library. That's uh, that's wow. something. Yeah. 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 Actually, one of my friends, like Jimmy Hipper, and uh, he paid a visit to Japan like a couple months ago, and he requested a, uh, a Ming Dynasty like a uh, Gaoling's book, like you know, in Japan, like a copy of that. So, yeah, it's a PDF version. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> And that's that's awesome. pretty, it's pretty interesting. Now, on, on the note about uh, different versions and different languages, how did you approach the, the translation of Gao Ying's work? Very slowly and with many early morning tra <laughs> translations. Yeah, that's, yeah, uh, that's a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun, fun moments. You know? Yeah. You know, at the time, I was living in uh, Buffalo, New York, and, uh, you know, East, East Coast, and he, he, he's li living like, he was living like, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, So, yeah. you know, we have to do, like, you know, video chat and stuff like that, and Google, like a document, like a Google Doc editing at the same time. That's well, right. That's just some, lot of, right. lot of it. <laughs> yeah, I just remember. I that. remember, like, sit there, like, for hours to just uh, retype the whole, like, thing, like, into the computer. And a lot of, like, you know, classic Chinese words, like, you know, it's kind of hard to, to type that thing, like, into the computer for sure. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was getting up at, like, 4.30, just, like, <laughs> started. And we just do it like this one segment at a time. Yeah. And then we're like, you know, I, I think it means this. And Joe's like, no, I think it actually means yeah. this. And it's like, no, but it should be actually this way. Yeah. And <laughs> going back and forth and That's just right. like kind of, you know, painfully and laboriously going through each of the passages. Um, yeah. Not just translation, though, because it, have it's to, yeah. it's more than just an academic exercise of like looking at the word and turning it into English, Ooh, right? Not it's, just that. Yeah. Like, Way more than that. Actually. Absolutely. Like, you know, we're archers, right? We, we like to shoot. We want to see that these things work. And so, um, we want to, you know, we see a passage, then we try to put it into practice. Mm -hmm. like, does it work or not? That's like right. early on, I thought, um, you know, that the shoulder position advocated in Gaoyang's book was more like the straight line thing. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I'm like, well, it's not not working. It's kind of hurting, you know. It's not. And then because and Jay actually initially said, no, it's actually got a little bit of an angle to it. You have to settle the shoulder down. And I was like, huh. And then eventually he was right, you know. And then we would have these back and forth exchanges where we would have different ideas. Uh, but because we wanted to see the end result, like That's that it actually worked, then we would sort of, our understanding would converge at the end. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of practice and a lot of translation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that that's frankly one of the most uh, amazing things in um, your book, actually, um, because obviously we we didn't have uh, uh, photos of Gao Ying style back then. So trying to reconstruct the technique purely from text, uh, I imagine that would have been one of the biggest challenges. And uh, as for us today, we're fortunate that we have these references um, where we we can see it being done, we can see the demonstrations, and we see the photographs. Um, something which uh, back then. You know, I, I can only imagine how hard it would have been to transmit, you know, the techniques which you were taught um, across all of China. Yeah, that's, um, well, probably largely, you know, um, you know, just teaching in person, right? Not much, not much of it. As, as Gao Ying himself uh, lamented, you know, the people who were good, they would, 
keep it a secret and they wouldn't write it down, right? Or or they were not even able to write, right? <laughs> they were just like, they're just like or jocks, just, you know, just, like, just you know, super aces, but they couldn't write, right? So they their their techniques were they don't know lost. how to like uh, put it into words. And then you got the other branch of people and who are scholars, hundred yeah, exactly. percent. They, they never shoot and they just write a bunch of like random stuff <laughs> on it. They can look fancy, and uh, but you know when you tried it, it doesn't make sense, you know. <laughs> It's interesting that this is true across most archery styles. Either you're right, either the masters not you came to them and you learned from them, or they didn't share it. Um, the other thing is either it, this, especially for the the Western European archery, English archery, where the skill was so common, nobody wrote about it. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, in the future, if you you know shovels are so common, nobody. Well, I don't know if you're going to find a manual of shovel construction, but, you know, <laughs> down the road, if somehow we lost all of them, then somebody asked, well, how do you, how do you make this thing, right? Um, maybe maybe it's not the best analogy, but you, you get what I mean, right? It's like, it was so commonplace, you take it for granted, and then if something happens, you, um, you're you left scrambling for, you know, a reference on how to re redo it, how to reconstruct it. Absolutely. Okay, so um, and a lot of people are now asking about getting started with Chinese archery, and that segues into our next uh, big topic. So, um, the the next question comes from: well, How does one begin uh, doing traditional Chinese archery? Hmm. Well, um, one of the links that we'll provide is uh, a uh, Kung Fu Magazine interview that I did uh, back in. It was 2018. I'll have to double check, but yeah, it yeah it's it's got a it, it helps answer a lot of these questions in terms of how to get started, what sort of beginner equipment to select, and so forth. Uh, that's also linked off of our tutorials page on our uh, the Way of Archery website. Mm -hmm. So if you go navigate to our tutorials page on the Way of Archery site, then um, one of those links will include a link to that Kung Fu Magazine interview as well as other resources that can help you get started in Chinese archery. But um, you know, if you were to, uh, you know, get someone started in Chinese archery, what would what would you recommend? Yeah. Uh, I say like you know, get a cheap bow first, and uh, you know, set up arrows, and uh, just uh, you know, try it out. Like you know, uh, if uh, see if you like it or not, and uh, if you really like it, and just like you know, gradually like a, a upgrade. And uh, and uh, I think most important thing for beginners is having a like a gaudian target. Like I said, like you know, at home, so you can like uh, read the book and also like you know practice like a form at home. Oh, and then we really sure. this, okay. this so he's, like... he's, he's gonna carry that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is this is my garage. I'm practicing here. This is my um, Godwin yeah. fail. I shoot it a lot. Yeah, we are still doing that. Like even we've been doing this for like years. But uh, I think it's pretty important for like a beginners to like get it started. Like. Uh, um, because you want to, like, a perfect form first and then, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, go outside to shoot, like, uh, do the target shooting. That's mm -hmm. very important. Do it step by step instead of just jumping to it. And also some people, like, would like to start with, like, a really heavy bow. And that's kind of, like, a, injure yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not good. So, you know, so like, a step by step. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, uh, Justin, yeah. you, you shoot, like, a 100-pound yeah. plus well, bow now. Well, I, 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 I've made that mistake of starting with a bow that's too heavy, and it sucks because... You're going to develop really bad habits, and then you have to be really, really diligent to overcome them. Otherwise, you are left with a really um, crappy, like rushed, uh, sh you know, um, out of control technique. So I, I highly recommend against it. And this is coming from the guy who can shoot like a 115 pound bow. So, like, you know, this is def form is definitely number one yeah. in terms of developing. Yeah. And yeah. Especially if you want to, if you know, if you want to shoot a lot, you, you should definitely like make sure your phone is right. You know, for some like uh, weekend shooters, and you know, it's just like shoot 20, 20 shots or 30 shots at the range and go back, and you know, and I think that'll be alright. But uh, for some like a serious shoot, shoot uh, like uh, archers, you know, you have to like make sure that the phone is uh, is uh, is uh, correct before going to like you know do some serious uh, practice. So ideally, um, you can first get an introduction from someone who knows how to practice the style, or at least pick up some of the basics, you know, how to use the thumb ring, how to hold the bow, how to handle a bow without a shelf, without sights, um, using this particular style. And off of our website, we have a training programs section, and we have lists of people who are alumni of the Chinese archery program who'd be happy to sort of, um, you know, get in touch and, and help provide an intro. Um, so getting an intro from someone who knows the style um, 
is a good first step. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I would still recommend, like in my case, I got started with Western barebow recurve. Like that at least provides structure and you get used to the safety protocol of going to the range and yes. how to interact with other people at the range as well. When you have that as a foundation, then transitioning to uh, Chinese archery is, you know, it's, it's relatively e easier. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of which, um, uh, what advice do you have for people who are switching over from uh, Western or Olympic recurve? Well, the um, I've I've given intros to Western recurve shooters that only take maybe like five minutes. Like, all they they really just have to adapt, say the draw hand mm -hmm. and how to hold the bow, and also an arrow on the on the right side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, cause they're the right hand. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like the. Um, they're used to uh, unplug the pops. Um, there you go. Yeah, they're used to having the arrow on the other side, but we actually put the arrow on the um, the thumb side, and they'll say, "Oh man, this this arrow is shooting like way to the right from what I'm used to." <laughs> well, yeah, you know, there's no shelf, um, and your brain is used to the arrow being on, on this side, right. and so it's on this yeah. side. There's that. Um, there are also other complicating factors, like when I teach people, I give them like a really light bow, but um, arrows that are probably usually a little too, too stiff. stiff that's right. Yeah, so it's going to go to the right, and so I just tell them, ah, just aim to the left for now. But when your form improves and your release improves, then um, you'll get you know, straighter, what, what will look like straighter flight. So that's right. That's, that's one. So the initial adaptation with the draw hand and the bow hand is pretty straightforward, um, but one big difference I'll say between from 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 my experience of interacting with people who practice like Olympic recurve versus more traditional forms of archery is in the kind of arm and shoulder alignment as well. That's right. Now um, I'm gonna butcher this hopefully not too much, but with the uh, with the Western recurve form it's the the bow arm's a little more straight like this and the um, sorry the Olympic recurve form anchoring under the chin, then the that side is more like this. And with this, the goal for target shooting is to um, minimize the number of muscles that are activated, you know, just activate some core back muscles so that you have more reproducible shot, right? Because if you're activating muscles in your arm and the hand and this, then that introduces more variability in your shot. All right, so that's, that's the, um, and it's very successful for the goal of getting precision and reproducibility. But in the military style of archery that we practice, we actually have more of an alignment that's like this, right? And you'll see this not just in... Uh, in jihadi style, but yeah. also in like Western, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I wouldn't say, uh, at least if we see it in Ga, the Gao Ying style that, mm -hmm. that we advocate, but um, you'll see it in other styles of military archery from other cultures, that's like right. the English uh, warbow archers or the African elephant hunters. Mm -hmm. Um, or you know, various other cultures. The Japanese, like uh, the Japanese like military style. Military style. Yeah, yeah. That's right. What you see there is the alignment which uses the um, the back muscles on both sides of the back more evenly. Like not just the the traps and the rhomboids, but also the lats as well. So this is this is one kind of demonstration that we give uh, during the Chinese archer program or whenever we introduce people to the style, just to give them a taste of what. You know, what makes military archery different from um, is sort of modern recurve archery. All right. So here I'm exerting the muscles on both sides of my back very evenly. All right. Here I'm exerting the muscles on both sides of my back evenly, right? Even, even. And it's still even for the back. But the arms, when I reach out like this, then what's happening? I'm pointing up into the air right here. That's why in the traditional styles, if you want to shoot at a level target, you gotta cant the torso a bit while maintaining an even exertion of the muscles in your back. That explains the style that we have going here like this. People say, well, it's not you know linear and even, but you know, show me yourself sh shooting a 115 pound bow, 150 pound bow, 200 pound bow, you know, doing another technique, then yeah. maybe we can talk, right? 
And uh, uh, one thing interesting too is that um, th there's a noticeable uh, uh, angle of the back. Instead of like standing straight up, you kind of put uh, you avoid that pressure in your lower back, right? So you lean forward a bit more. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's more. It's more. Um, if you kept your torso straight and had the same technique, you would be shooting up into the air. Right. So, but then it's just a matter of like, shifting your hips if you want to get that angle to shoot level. Yeah, just a tiny bit. Just a tiny bit, yeah. Like you no don't do it. Don't don't be this guy. <laughs> <laughs> tiny. Right. Don't don't. Yeah. Just um. There's um. Yeah. There's there's a. Uh, you know, it's just just a. It's just do it subtly. That's right. So that's yeah. right. For like most of beginners, you, you want to adjust it a little bit, tiny bit, like and try it out. Hmm. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now there've been a few questions in the chat as well, and uh, we all, actually had raised this already, but um. We, we just we just bring it up um Cinnabar, funny enough but uh the question was that uh you know in terms of like getting equipment like what what brands and what things should we be looking at getting to uh to get started with chinese archery get started um yeah i think you know you know you know there was a lot of brand out there uh, nowadays like not like a, not like now when we get started like a long time ago so you know from from my suggestion is just, uh, you know, get something cheap, like get like a fiberglass bow. Like, you know, you can get like something from Ali bow or some other, like, you know, some other brand, you know, just to try it out. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, for laminated bows, I think if you decided to like get into it and uh, dig into it, and uh, you should definitely get a laminated bow because it's more efficient, less hand shot, and also like, uh, you know, pretty easy to shoot, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so historically, in terms of Chinese bows, uh, the Chinese used it not just horn composite bows, you know, horn composite bows with horn on the belly, um, wood or bamboo in the middle, sinew on the back, and then maybe some covering. Um, the, the horn bows are one type of bow that was used in the Chinese sphere. Um, wooden self bows were actually used as well, yeah. uh, especially in the, the hotter southern climates, um, also in like the early days, because there's some, you know, the early, um, I forget which. Um, which stories it was, but they would say that they would hang a uh, a mulberry bow and reed arrows over the door if a if a boy was born. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. like a full bow people, yeah. That's a mulberry self bow, right? So self bows are part of the Chinese uh, canon, so to speak. That's right. And then also, uh, you know, bamboo composite, uh, bamboo like laminated bows. That's right. Um, and also oh, like yeah. sinew backed wood bows, sinew backed bamboo bows, like you name it, right? But that's historic. Now, as for nowadays, yeah, like Jim mentioned, uh, less expensive fiberglass bows. Yeah, there are like so plastic bows that are, you know, around like ninety-five dollars that you can get, as well. Um, that would be the like the Elong brand, but um, you can also invest a little more to get something that is laminated, but maybe around like the three hundred dollar range. That would be, um, you know, pretty nice to shoot with. That's right. Yeah, because sometimes if your bow is a little too cheap, then as a beginner, you're like, eh. You know, this is not quite working out, but maybe it's just the equipment, right? You, you invest a little more, then you can take the equipment part out of the equation and focus on your form. That's right. So, yeah, like uh, fiberglass bows, plastic bows, good for beginners, laminated bows for like beginner, intermediate, intermediate advanced archers. Yes, sir. If you're a diehard, um, like if you're really into the cultural aspect of it, then you can look into horn bows, bows yeah. or, um, you know, natural bows made of like wood sinew or bamboo, bamboo things yeah. like that. Yeah. Speaking of materials, um, that jumps into our next question. And uh, uh, obviously, I recently bought my Mariner bow, and uh, you know, you all these options of customization, like fiberglass and wood and carbon. Like, what's the difference between all these different materials that you can get for bows, especially comparing like the historical materials or the hardcore, you know, horn and sinew versus the fiberglass, carbon, and wood from today? Mm. Oh, I I say from my personal experience, I like like you know shooting like a laminated bow, at, you know for now, like you know, cause uh, you know he he has uh, the, 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 uh, like you know home bow. It's uh, it's not that <laughs> not that like, you know a, hand, a lot of hand shot and stuff like that. But uh, you know, I think it's uh, always good to like shoot a uh, like a laminated bow, right? Yeah, I mean yeah, the difference is yeah yeah this uh, it's a pleasure to shoot and. Uh, one is like a little bit tough to like handle. Yeah, yeah the horn bows are kind of, um, you know, they're they're a bit like a pet. <laughs> you know, they have its, it has its quirks. You have to kind of get used to it. 
it's not, at least my experience so far, they're not as fast as laminated bows, but I'm keeping my opinion on that open because I haven't tried to counter like a really fast, like uh, used a like really fast uh, horn bow yet. So, but I, but in general, like the laminated bows, they're just easy to maintain, you string them. And um, that would be, that would be sort of, sort of from a user perspective, the yeah. differences, like the laminated bows um, will be, you know, faster. faster um, uh, the horn bow, to their credit though, the horn bows, super tough. Oh yeah? Yeah. Like, like really, really kind of, kind of tough. They can take a lot of abuse, but. And the um, poundage can go up with no problem. And like for laminated bows, you gotta be very careful, like, you know, when you handle like a super yeah. heavy, like a, yeah. you know, poundage. Now we're talking a lot about laminated bows. Some people are like, are saying like, well, what's that, you know? So what it is, it's like a layers of materials used stack, stacked up um, one behind the other to construct the limb. Uh, in a modern laminated bow, usually it's uh, fiberglass on the outer layers, one to take compression on the belly side, one to take tension on the back side. And the inner materials for the laminated bow, the goal is to make that part um, strong but light. And so that's why you would put something like wood or bamboo in the middle, mm. so they decrease the mass of the limb. You know, if your limbs are lighter, if the tips of your bow, like uh, if the tips of your bow are lighter, then you'll have a more efficient bow as well. That's right. Why don't I actually, you know, show a laminated bow? Yeah. While it's here, so and also yeah, like, just uh, let you guys know, like we are actually the first first uh, people like introduce a uh, 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 like you know a uh, professional uh, archery glass to Chinese like you know. Uh, bow, bow, mo uh, bowyers. Bow makers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So back at that time, like you know, they 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 were using like you know a construction fiberglass to build the bows. That was not that good, you know. <laughs> I break like a several. But then like after they, uh, everybody like switching to like you know uh, uh, like you know uh, like a, a archery glass, and uh, I think the quality is pretty good right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm actually showing a um, a raptor made by. Simon Vander Hayden, you know, Simon's Bow Company. Uh, but what, what I will say again for the laminated bow, it's usually glass on the belly and the backside, and then a core made of wood or bamboo to make it lighter. Sometimes people will put materials in the core to help the torsional stability, so things like stable core. Or carbon. Like a, yeah, or carbon. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll do that as well. So these are enhancements that will... Might make, not like uh, make it more efficient, but uh, right. you know... But you know, stability, yeah. you know, forgiveness on the release, is a quality that some some experienced archers might want because, yeah, yeah. you know, if you want reproducibility, and say you're tired, you don't, and your release is like not the most, you know, your release is like plucking to the side or something mm -hmm. like that. A bow that um, is a little more torsionally stable will not be as affected by a bad release. So yeah. you'll you'll buy yourself a little forgiveness there. That's right. That's really, really interesting. Uh, a lot of um, similarities to uh, well, any kind of archery, really. So uh, I think um, anyone who's transitioning from, uh, you know, Western recurve or uh, Olympic recurve will find that um, a lot of the same principles will apply. So uh, that's, uh, that's really, really really fascinating. Um, I guess we'll move on to the next question. Uh, so we've gone through quite a few things. Um, by the way, you, you, you brought up the, uh, the, the bow there, and one of the questions that was brought up was the idea of string bridges in bow design. Can you tell us more about um, the, you know, what, what's a string bridge and you know, what's the difference between a bow which has one and one that doesn't have one? Sure. Um, well, do you feel like explaining this? Or? No, you can go ahead. All right, here we go. Um, this is a string bridge. It's on the, uh, like, the usually on some part of the tip. In this case, this is a Manchu style bow. And the goal of the string bridge is to um, catch the string in case you have like a really bad release that 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 you know pushes the string one way or the other. On the string, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's basically what it's for. It does not make the bow faster. In, in fact, it adds mass to the tips, mm. makes it a little slower. So, um, but it's it's there because at least in the case of a Manchu bow, you see that this tip. It's much longer compared to, say, like this bow right here. A small tip bow. Yeah. yeah, and this this longer tip, forward pointed tip, gives you more leverage on the pull. Like it'll feel very hard to pull it first, but once you get past a certain angle, so I can introduce this right here. Once you get past a certain angle, it feels easier. Right. And uh, but because this in the Manchu bow, the tip is so large. 
then um, it has the potential, like it, it has the potential to be sort of pulled off access a little more because it's a longer lever, right? right? So that's that's why they have bridges in the Manchu bows just to catch it, just in case something something happens there. And also the angle is like more like forward. Yeah, like um, you'll also see something that's not quite a bridge, but like a string pad. Like this is a Korean bow right here. So it's got a string pad. Well, I, I call it a string pad anyway. Some people might call it a bridge. And that's just to help um, that's to help catch the string as well. But you see it's not as prominent on this one. So it's not going to affect the tip mass as much. Interesting. I, I didn't know that either. So that was a, a good question to ask and a well, uh, well covered. Um, and we've got a few more questions to go through. Um, now, uh, in your demonstration before, you were using a, a very long draw, and that's actually one of the distinguishing factors between um, Eastern style archery, uh, well, Eastern archery styles, and Western, especially modern style. Um, what anchor points are used in Chinese archery? What do you think? It varies, right? Yeah. 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 There's a lot. I mean, you, you'll look at the artwork and you'll see um, anchor. The thing is, again, China, huge place, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of different ideas on how to do archery. So um, you will see some drawings of, like, someone on a horse drawing to this, only to this draw length. Yeah. You will see draw lengths as far as this. <laughs> like, there's the one with this, um, like, there's a guy uh, hunting birds. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like he's, like, pulling all the way That's back it. here. And then you'll see, you know, more moderate draws, yeah, it's like, like what we're doing. Draw, yeah. yeah. Or sometimes you'll see slightly smaller draws, like more to the mouth. So it varies quite a lot. Right. Our our preference is to be, um, at least Jen and my preference is to be around the ear or around just behind the ear. Yeah, yeah. Just behind a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, and but th then you ask like, well, how do you maintain a consistent anchor that way? I think that's that's what the question is getting to, right? Mm. Um, and the well, if you have an anchor at your face, obviously you can your hand can touch the face. But if it's you're pulling past your face, past your ear. Um, then there are three dimensions that you have to account for. So there's the um, the up-down dimension you account for with you know touching the feather or the shaft at a certain level on your face. Then on, then the left-right dimension you account for by making sure that you touch at all lightly because you don't want to have your hand out here trying to pull it. That's the recipe for variability. Like that's you're not gonna have control that way. And then for the third dimension, the front back dimension, this is pretty critical, right? Because you want the draw length to be consistent if you are, um, if you know, if you want to have the same amount of energy going to each arrow. And so that's where um, you can either go by how your back feels when you're at full draw, or you know, listening for the string or feeling that your hand is at a certain position. This is if you're going for a longer draw. Or you can use a bow hand anchor, a draw length indicator. So um, one of the Chinese archery program alumni, Blake Cole, wrote a nice article about bow hand anchors. Highly recommend people go take a look at that. Yeah. Basically, you know, you will touch the back of the arrowhead. And in classical Chinese canon, there's an expression like if your finger doesn't touch, just yeah, if it doesn't touch the back of the arrowhead. Then it's as if you're shooting blind. Yeah, from our experience, I think this is the best way to keep, keep like consistency because you can't touch the, the back of the arrowhead. But and, uh, mostly like back in ancient time, they shoot like a broadhead. So the, 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 the arrowhead is pretty long, so you know it's no problem to touch the, the back of the arrowhead. But uh, today it's like you know shooting points, right? Yeah, yeah. So and be, and be careful, but uh, you know it's still manageable. There, there are several things you could do to to get that bow hand anchor, you could like wrap tape, you could yeah. wrap sinew, um, you could have like a slightly fatter arrow, arrowhead, lighter right. shaft as well, I don't know if you can see this, using a slightly wider head yep. here. Cool. What it looks like when you're shooting this is I'm gonna keep pulling, uh, I'm gonna step here, until I touch the, uh, the draw length indicator. So that's that's how you account for that front back aspect of the, the anchor. 
Yeah, that, that's got a lot of similarities to the Olympic clicker. That's what the, when people yes. told me about the uh, the bow hand anchor, like, that's exactly what we do. And like for you, like is the process automatic? Like for Olympic archers, the moment we hear the click, we let go. Is this, it's the same thing for you when you have the bow anchor. Yeah, yeah, it's something you have to get used to and, and conditioned for because you don't want to get too jumpy and anticipate it. You're like, mm. oh, have I touched it yet? No, I'm gonna yank it back in the last. Thing. No, that's gonna screw. <laughs> Well, like you gotta you gotta be able to expand your draw length in a very controlled manner, and then as soon as you touch it, have the discipline to, you know, continue to release at that point. Because what you don't want to do is, um, and this is the source for a lot of problems in people's release as well, which is you reach the the bow hand anchor, and then you just kind of hold it there, because bad bad things can happen, such as like, you know, you lose energy and you creep forward. And then you release, and that's not mm. that's a bad thing to do, right? Like that's you know, that's not a good release. Yeah. So um you have to have the discipline to like as soon as you perceive it, to continue and release. Yeah. So about the control. Right, yeah. Mm, all right. That's that's really good. Now speaking of technique, uh this is something which is raised by quite a few people. It's uh it's katra. Uh it's uh, I know I know if Gao Yin does not um, really encourage or teach Katra. In fact, I think he kind of makes fun of it by uh, talking about how it's a bit flamboyant, a bit too uh, too much flourish. What's his position on on Katra, and uh, and how how do you avoid uh, the issues like the arrow slapping the inside of the bow? Mm. Um, I can do this. All right, cool. So um, well, we have to distinguish between three types of bow hand um, follow throughs, right? So there is the there is the the hatra, which is like a downward and leftward type movement, accomplished in my understanding is by squeezing those like bottom fingers, keeping the top part of the hand relaxed. Then there is the sideways hatra. I think that some people do, which is accomplished by um, you know having the bow turn like this. Um, and then there's painting the ground, which is this follow through where you're turning the bow all the way, like so. So Gao Ying has a passage where he criticizes painting the ground because that that's like a recipe for just throwing off the shot, right? If you're, because the problem is that you're supposed to, with painting the ground, you're supposed to just have it happen naturally as a result of relaxing the bow hand. The problem is people get fixated on that whole motion because it looks cool. I mean, let's face it, it looks pretty damn cool, you know? Um, but then that, that, that becomes a distraction and it just throws off your shot for long distance shots. That's um, cool. like you, it's no longer relaxed. You become, become something that becomes forced. Yeah. So, um, that's why he was criticizing painting the ground. Um, for the sideways Hatra, he doesn't talk about that so much. Um, and, but I would say that if it's an active movement, that's probably something that you don't that's right. that you don't want. Yeah, from our experience, Zuba, like you know, don't do it like intentionally. Like you don't want to like yeah. do it like intentionally after release. Cause think about it, like you know, I don't know if anybody uh, try like a shoot a pistol or something. Like you know, if you mm -hmm. jerk the finger a little bit, the 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 the, 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 the bullet's gonna go up or down. Like you know, and the you know, bullets are faster than arrow. Think about like if you like move your bow hand like a lot intentionally uh, after release, it's gonna lead the arrow to some other directions. So like that's a bad recipe for like you know for 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 like you know uh, consistency. Right? Yeah, let's imagine like have a crossbow, and then on each shot, I'm gonna jerk the crossbow to yeah. the left or down and forward. You know that that's gonna throw things off. Um, also, well. You know, so Gaoyan criticizes it. Obviously, there were contemporary Ming Dynasty Chinese styles that advocated using a hatra type movement. Um, that's called um, Pie, I think. No, no, Pie. 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 Yeah, it's called Pie, and um, that was written in the Wubei Yaoyue Manual, where yeah, you like tilt the bow. Well, the tip of the bow will go down and left, like hatra. I mean, it basically is hatra. And for for us, like you know, if we have a okay, oh, yeah, sure. If we have a like a, you know kind of like a loose like a grip, you know, after release you might unintentionally like have this movement. It's yeah. all right. That's but don't thing. do like you know intentionally. Like That's that. the thing. Ga Gaoying does not. I mean, no style recommends. Well, I wouldn't say no style, but Gaoying doesn't recommend an iron grip. Like that's a surefire yeah. way to increase the um, 
you know, the rotational inertia of the handle to just make it, it's just too much rotational inertia for the arrow to overcome. So it's going to just mess up the arrow flight. That's right. So what Gauguin recommends is, you know, you hold with the bottom two fingers, you have sort of a, a, a relaxed, semi-relaxed grip. And then whatever happens with the bow, whatever movement happens, happens. You don't, you don't, uh. that's not possible to make that movement happen. It's just a natural consequence of having the proper grip. Yeah, and those are like, you know, he was talking about like even for a very heavy bow, you use a full, full grip. Like, but still don't grip it like a super tight. You don't want to make it, make it like a super tight, super like intense. Yeah, if you watch, if you watch me shoot, like you'll see that the move, the bow turns a little bit. And I've had actually had um, discussions with uh, Murat Osveri, you know, mm. very, very well known, very um, influential Turkish traditional archer, um, you know, kind of almost well, single-handedly responsible for, for reestablishing art, uh, traditional archery in Turkey. And, uh, you know, we got into the subtleties of like, Hatra, does, does Gauging advocate it or not? And what I would say is that um, what we do is kind of like a mini Hatra, but it's not intentional, hmm. right? It's just, it'll, you know, the, mo the momentum of the arrow will make the bow turn a little bit like that. Yeah. And, uh, but it's not, our goal is not to make that happen. It just, it just happens. As a result, something else based on our posture. Um, when you're using the lats, you know, the lats allow you to have this sort of a, you know, downward force on the arm, and then of course the traps and the rhomboids let you to have a bit of a backward force in the arm. So if you're sustaining the bow arm in position at full draw and you release, guess what? There's no more force pulling the bow back. So there's going to be a bit of a natural reaction like this after the shot, but that's yeah. after the sh that's after the arrow has left the bow. Yeah. Right. But if you're doing like something like this yeah. after the shot, or if it's happening like just before the release or during the release, then that's that's something you want to avoid. Yeah, your arrow might go low or maybe you know to the to the left. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. not good, you know. Yeah. Sim simplest advice would be to just keep your bow hand in place, yeah. have a relaxed, semi-relaxed grip. And yeah. focus on you know using your back and you having sure yourself uh, you know act like uh, yourself as a uh, crossbow. You know, yes, that's, that's the point. Yeah, put the sock in place, then you know press the trigger, then you're yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I found similar things too. I was experimenting with thumb draw. It's a very yeah. natural motion. You didn't really, you know, intentionally fling the arrow off. But um, it, back when I first started doing um, uh, Asiatic archery, a lot of people were watching. Hey, you've got a side cut trust. Well, I'm not really trying to do so, but it just is it's a natural consequence. And I was really happy to explain the the musculature. That's basically what happens. Yeah, and actually, I want to add to that as well. So um, the hatra, it's it actually has an effect. Like, there's no denying that, right? What the Hatcher does is it reduces the rotational inertia of the handle of the bow so that the arrow doesn't have to flex as much to bend around the handle mm. and, and clear it. That's, that's for sure. Now, the question is, do you want to practice it or not? Do you want to, is that one more thing you want to add to your checklist in terms of form? And our philosophy, Gallian's philosophy, is like, too complicated. You know, just, you know, just keep it relaxed. You know? I mean, you might... Like you know, sacrifice the accuracy too. So yeah. that's that's there's something a, there's you want to consider. You know, sacrifice the accuracy and the consistency. Yeah. For doing adding like a tiny bit of speed on it. It's not yeah. worth it or not. You know. So and also a very prominent example with the side hatra of well, you know, the with uh, kudo, with Japanese archery, the the yugi, I think it's called yugi eri, like the one yeah. where the the post turns around like this. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I've talked with you know. It, uh, very experienced Japanese uh, archery teachers about this as well. The, this happens as a natural consequence of shooting the bow. Also, the Japanese yumis, their bow string is kind of um, biased to one side as yep. well. So that encourages spinning of the bow. But in any case, yeah, it spins like itself naturally if you have the, the bow hand like that. Yep. But if you're practicing... Um, horse archery with that style where you're trying to do rapid shooting, you don't want your bow to spin around all the way. Because yeah. then you're going to have to put it all the way back to get to, get yeah, to the next arrow. There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> but what matters is the tendency for that bow to want to spin prior to the shot. Because that's going to reduce, you know, it's what you do before the shot that really affects the shot. What you do after, like, 
you know, I can shoot and then like dance and then yeah. it's just hard, right? Uh, but it's what you do before the shot that matters. And yeah. that is that tendency that is common to the approach of whether you, you know, let it relax or you let it spin around. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a lot of uh, again parallels with again even modern Olympic archery. We have that bow swinging with you know, that happens, and people think, "Oh, why do people do that?" It's a follow through, you know. It's not forced. It's not natural, and people shouldn't try to emulate that. Again, a lot, a lot of us are visual learners, so we see someone do like a swing or a katra, and we try and incorporate well, that. Well, I've heard another, um, at least an, an Olympic archery uh, coach describe that this or what is it, this movement after the shot, mm. is um, to give the brain something to focus on mm. so that you're less distracted. And I'm like, okay, I can kind of see the merits of that. But um, like for me, myself, I just want to keep it simple. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, we've got to a, a lot of uh, data about technique, so we'll probably go through a couple more. Um, so one of the questions which was brought up in the uh, the initial batch was talking about the the single hook versus the double hook. Can you talk more about the differences in that technique? Sure. Um, let's see if I can demonstrate this. So, oh, there it is. Just looking at my ring. The Double hook is where you've got um, two fingers covering the thumb, and then single hook is where you've got one finger covering the thumb. Now, Gao Ying talks about, now Gao Ying's variation of the double hook is so. Like you, you pull it back like this, you know, one and a half fingers covering the thumb, and then when you release, you actually clip the middle finger back and you release, and it looks like a single hook at the end. Right? But you're pulling with two fingers or one and a half fingers up to this point. But what I found, and, and, and this is just sort of part of our approach, like we gotta see what works, right? In theory, yeah, double hook should be stronger than single hook, okay? But what, what we found in practice is that at some point, the alignment of the ring through the wrist, through the elbow, matters a lot for pulling heavier draw weights. So um, what, what I've found at least is that with the, um, I should not do this with, yeah. with the double hook, I'm pulling it like so, but there's a little bit of, um, it's not quite straight with the elbow here. If I changed it to a single hook here, a floating single hook, you notice that that, um, that, that thumb joint can get a little straighter in line with the wrist, in line with the elbow. And if I can relax the thumb joint, or the, the thumb knuckle, the wrist through the elbow, that's one less element for me to worry about. Um, one less part of the body to spend energy on when pulling a really heavy bow. And that, that's and that's kind of and at least for my hand anatomy, you know, other people's hand anatomies, maybe they can get that good alignment between ring, thumb knuckle, wrist, and elbow with a double hook. But for me, I just found that above, um, it's like 90 pounds or 100 pounds, like I needed this extra relaxation in the forearm in order to pull that heavier draw weight. And also, like, Gawain is using, uh, he, 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 he used his own type of ring. So that the ring can yes. be like a little bit different too. So, you know, um, the style of the ring, like you, you're using also like, you know. This, this stuff, right? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, pretty similar. Yeah, just pretty much this. <laughs> yeah, these are um, these were um, given to us by custom thumb rings. This is the the ring that is based on the illustrations in the book, the Gaoying's Four Victory Ring. Yeah. Um, I'm only just experimenting with it now because this is the sort of the first time I've had like an actual real life specimen about on this. So maybe double hook will act differently for this. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. I'll have to try it out. Take some time to try it out, right? So, so, can we see the ring one more time up close? That's a oh, yeah, huge yeah. ring. Uh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh there, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Camera's up there. there we go. That's a huge ring. <laughs> yeah, it looks like this. Yeah. That's legit. Uh, <laughs> is that based off the historical rings? Yeah, I think uh, based on the illustration in the book. Wow. Which, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. It's nice for a first time. Yeah. So definitely looking forward to uh, experimenting with this. Yeah. I'll report back on, <laughs> on findings. That's amazing. You know, I, I, I want a question for chat, by the way. I, I know you were seeing me play my thumb just before while uh, Justin was explaining. Was I the only one doing that? Like, were, were you doing that as well in your, your end? <laughs> so let me know in chat if you were kind of doing a double hook or sing hook in your, um, in your end. Because I couldn't help but uh, start uh, experimenting with the, uh, the musculature there. That was actually really interesting. Uh, that's amazing. Um, now, again, a different, different technique. Now, we're moving on to uh, the inchworm technique. Um, well, my first question is, well, what is it, firstly? Uh, and the second thing is, uh, the question was, can inchworm be used for fast shooting, as in uh, mamluk archery? So, I guess, you know, what is the inchworm and can it be used for fast shooting? I think it can. Like, you know, in the in the book, like uh, in the original book, the illustration, like the whole process of the inchworm form is like you lower the shoulder and lift it up and uh, and reach the full draw. And, uh, you know, but if you do a lot, like, you know, like us, you know, you don't have to, like, uh, you know, lower the shoulder no more. Because when you, like, uh, when you, like, make your uh, uh, the arm straight, it's, the shoulder is already lowered. Like, so, you know, just uh, draw it, shoot, it'll be fast. So I can do, like, something around two and uh, two to three seconds per shot, like, uh, out of the quiver, you not know, like holding arrows or something. Mm. So I think it'll be, it's doable for, like, a fast shooting. Yeah, yeah. Joe's much faster than I am in terms of the, the rapid shooting. Yeah. Um, and but also like the thing is like he's not just not doing this with like a 25 pound bow, right? Yeah, I'm he's doing using 50, 52, yeah, yeah, 52 yeah. Pound. yeah. I mean, because the whole idea behind the interim form is to get the shoulders and the arms aligned in a way that you yeah. can efficiently use, you know, both sides of your back muscles. So, so it, this is meant it's meant for military archery. Like yeah. you gotta shoot heavier. So that's why weight. you have to practice a lot and to reach that point instead of just jumping to it. Like for beginners, they don't even know how to lower the shoulder. So how can they just like you know do this? Because if he, they start with like, you know, up, up and down, like in the shoulder might be hunched. So, you know, uh, do a step by step again. Yeah, the, um, yeah. I think someone asked, I remember seeing a question, someone said like, well, you know, could they use these weights from horseback? And the, um, you know, I'm, I'm training with a, like a 115 pound bow sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. This bow here, this is a different bow. Um, this bow is, let's measure it. So do my famous, you know, show the scale. You gotta measure and verify. Don't just say what it is, but actually measure it. Measure the draw weight. Okay, and then, all right, so this bow is like 93 and, you know, I haven't done it from horseback, but as far as being able to draw it back quickly, like you can do it. So I can do this a little better. As long as you like get that shoulder position ahead of time. Right. And I don't have multiple arrows with me, but you know. If you're training at a higher weight, then a lower, lighter weight is going to feel a little easier. You can shoot that a little more rapidly. So um, I think it's just a matter of training. Like you could, historical people who dedicated their lives to training could probably shoot those heavy bows from horseback. Yeah, they can do. Yep. And and you... I, I should point out, I should understand, that was a 90 plus pound bow. Okay, <laughs> Justin makes it look easy, right? But a lot of us in chat probably came and pulled 90 pound. I think uh, one of the visual deceptions is that everything looks easy when you train for it. So uh, that that's incredible. By the way, it's it doesn't look easy. It's not like we're pulling a twenty pound bow going wee like that. It's uh, yeah. Well, I did three shots. The first one I wasn't so happy with because I didn't get my shoulder quite settled in. So I was like, okay, I got to do a couple more shots to like you know make it make it all right. And then it boils down to technique, right? Like if you say like I can't do it, well then you have to ask like, is it training? Is it technique? Is it diet? Right. You have to investigate those things. And again, we have a nice article. Um, this is co-written by uh, Blake Cole and I, mm -hmm. linked off of our tutorials page called Beyond Strength, and it talks about the different aspects of training for um, you know war bow poundages in the Asiatic style. Hmm. Speaking of draw weights, uh, there's a question, and also um, Lisa in chat when I just asked the question, what draw weights we use historically, and we're thinking, I guess. The low end, I guess the top end, and perhaps the average. 
Um, well, we have uh, some slides actually to show for this. I don't know if you have that on screen at the moment. I'll do that right now. Yep, okay. talk through so, it. So, yeah, so the first slide should be about Tang Dynasty weights. So those were, um, and they distinguish between uh, those used for infantry versus those used for the, the horse archery part of the exam. I think if I remember the numbers correctly, and I'm not being able to see it on screen, but I think it was something like uh, 168 pounds was the test weight for infantry archery, and then like 93 pounds was a test weight for horse archery. Because, you know, horse, you're not going to have as stable a platform mm. as you do on the ground. Um, then if we go to the next slide, in the Song Dynasty, I think the weights there practiced were roughly about that same same range as well. Yep. Um, you know, it's like, you know, around 100 pounds for uh, horse archery and heavier for infantry archery. Now, those weights are pretty heavy in, um, because at that time there are no firearms. So everyone's strategy was just get the heaviest ass armor that you can <laughs> yeah. to stop all these. And then the, the people shooting the arrows were like, well, we got to use these heavy ass bows <laughs> to you know, shoot, shoot these guys with heavy ass armor, right? That's right. So um, that, that escalation kind of took place. But then when you go to the next slide, uh, with the Ming Dynasty, the high end of the poundages you see kind of decreases to like maybe like 130 pounds. Um, and there's a couple, few things going on there. One could be that the introduction of firearms may give you less incentive to be, you know, walking around in heavy armor. So you had to be a little more mobile. Uh. So you didn't need to go, to go after people. Um, the other is that the bows actually got more efficient, right? You had these, uh. you know, this type of bow being made that was, that was, um, you know, it was just a nice fast bow, yeah. right? And so you didn't need as much poundage to get a, a certain amount of kinetic energy or momentum coming out uh, with the arrow. And then I think, yeah, that's probably, I would say those are the two factors. One is um, firearms might have had something to do with it so that the, you know, that changed the armor equation then that changed the bow equation as a result. And the other could be that the bow design just, just got more efficient so you didn't have to crank up the poundage as much to get a good effect. That's mm. good. Now the, um, for, for Gao Ying, uh, we're still on that slide with the Ming uh, slide. Uh, beginner poundage was 39 pounds. Yeah. Mm. Like that's that's just the um, I mean, that's what you get started with. Um, but you know the the average for a war weight, I would say is probably like uh, 70 pounds to maybe like up to 130 pounds. And I don't but I don't know what that distribution. They just say this is the range. They don't tell you what the distribution or the average is there. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, you'll see stats for the Qing Dynasty. And this is sourced from, okay, so the previous ones for Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, and also for the Chengfen in the Ming Dynasty, those are from Stephen Selby's Chinese archery book. So I highly recommend getting that. The Qing Dynasty weights, they're sourced from Peter Decker's article on uh, historical Qing Dynasty draw weights. Now, Peter Decker, for those who aren't familiar, he is a, a renowned researcher in Qing Dynasty Manchu archery. So, and he's he does um, sort of academic professorial type research, and but he's not even he doesn't even have a PhD in that field. It's just something that he's passionate about. He's a very critical thinker, and has been able to produce a lot of good uh, literature on this, including uh, uh, the reference about the draw weights here. So hmm. at the minimum, you'll see like 67 pounds, yep. um, 80 pounds. Like the the Yongzheng Emperor said, like these people shooting really heavy bows. Well, actually, I'll, I'll save that anecdote for the end, sorry. Um, 80 pounds might be typical. To join the Imperial Hunt, you had to be able to shoot a 133-pound bow. And then there was this, like, one outlier, this dude who could target shoot with a 240-pound bow. Um, and that's that's pretty incredible. And so people wanted to imitate that guy. And so <laughs> the emperors, one of the emperors, the second emperor, I believe, in the Qing Dynasty, um, the Yongzheng Emperor, he was like, these people taking drugs, uh, trying to get stronger to shoot this heavy bow. It's, it's, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is shoot a bow that's 80 pounds, and you're good to go. You know, so that's uh, that gives you an idea of what you know. I think a viable military draw weight will probably be, you know, or a typical one would be like the 70, 80, 80 90, wrong, yeah, yeah. So, something like that. But there are people who can shoot heavier. Yeah. You know, and and for me. Um, like I weigh what, like 129, 130 pounds. Um, I'm able to shoot this 
you know, 115 pound bow that I uh, demonstrated in a previous video. And I'm not, you know, like super elite trainer or anything like that. So I think that, you know, there are people who can, um, you know, I, I, I believe that there are historical people who could have handled that weights, those yeah. weights. Now, how quickly is another map? That's <laughs> an issue, right? Um, but then, you know, there are different tactics too. It's not always about, you got to shoot the arrows as fast as possible, right? Mm. Sometimes it's about get close to make every arrow count. Like there's actually passages from uh, the Chi Ji Guang yeah, Ming guys. 20, 20, 20 meters and then you just shoot, right? Yeah, or like they'll say like, if you know the guy is, if you're able to hit for sure at 20, at 20 meters, then wait till you're 10 meters to hit him. Or if you can make the sure hit at 30 meters, wait till you're at 15 meters to hit them. Because close range uh, hit, like that's a just kill hit, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like, look, as long as you're away out of the guy range of the guy's spear, like, you know, a hit is a hit, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the, the really funny things when we talk about historical archery is people have this perception of, you know, shooting really quickly. There's like a hundred guys coming towards you. It's going to shoot really, really quickly. Go pow, 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 pow. But the reality is that the closer they are, the easier it is to hit. Yeah, and it varies too. You know, like there's um, there's a place for um, like long range volleys. Like, like you definitely need that in certain battle situations. But as battle progresses, like people get closer to each other and then you got to be able to shoot you know, up close. So, um, yeah, like there, I would say that there's, there's a different tactics required and, um, you know, there's a place for a sort of slow, um, hard hitting archery as well. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm still having trouble comprehending 240 pounds. That's, I mean, like for most of us, like even like a 60 pound bow is already, you know, heavy, a top end for us, you know, people don't really shoot. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, often you know, just casual shooters, and anything more than fifty pound or sixty pound is just you know way above that. So we're looking at a war bow, which is like twice double what you normally shoot, and then double on top of that is a two hundred forty pound bow. Yeah, I can't comprehend two forty. I'm just like you know the one fifteen is already um, you know it's challenging. It's getting more comfortable now, and I'm trying to progress you know beyond that a bit. But like two hundred forty is like. I don't know, that would crush me <laughs> like, like that. So that's that's pretty amazing to whoever was able to do that. Um, and actually the last slide, um, the next slide after that, I don't know if you were able to pull that one up. Got it. That sort of does a sort of comparative, you know, look at um, sort of uh, poundages, but also sort of techniques practiced for military and hunting cultures across the world. So on that slide, you know, we have the painting, the Ming painting right there. Um, and then on the upper right side, I believe it's Mark Stretton. He holds yep. the Guinness Book of World Records for shooting a 200-pound English longbow. I had the pleasure of meeting him, uh, as well as Joe Gibbs, um, who's another uh, famous warbow archer in the modern era, in 2013. You know, at one of the events called the St. George's Shoot, mm. um, and they they were you know they were real gentlemen. Like they were, you know, with warbow archery, you know, there's a lot of bravado, a lot of ego sometimes. But like these two, Mark Stratton and Joe Gibbs, they were they were very um, nice, uh, open people. They were happy to discuss uh, what they were doing, and we actually found a lot of similarities in terms of techniques between you know the the mink of the guying technique, what they were practicing, you know, compare notes, share ideas, and actually um, the during a presentation, I was showing that picture of the Ming picture on the upper left, mm. and then uh, Mark Stratton's partner Tina said. Hey, that looks like Mark in a dress, <laughs> right? That, that posture right there. Well, because you know the human body can only move in a certain number of configurations, That's right? Fair. If you're trying to shoot a heavy bow, you want to find the way that is the easiest. And it just so happens that across these different cultures, including on the uh, lower left, the elephant hunters, the Liangulu, who shot hundred-pound bows, um, you know they shot they shot with a very similar technique. You know, or like the historical Japanese archer from the 19th century, their alignment looks pretty familiar there. Yeah. Now, granted, in the lower right, um, you do see that sort of sloping bow arm uh, and a closed draw arm for the uh, uh, what branch is that? That's the Hepki Ryu Bishu Chikorin Ha style. They're drawn longer, right? That's why that 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 they're drawn really long. That's why that arm is back there like that. But you know, other elements of it, like the slight cant of the torso. It's in there. Ah. And there's 
you know, people in those style, they're able to shoot bows up to, what is it, 76 kilos? It's like around 170 pounds. So, um, you know, it can be done, but you'll notice that the anatomy of these people is quite similar. Oh, Howard Hill's on that slide, too. Yes. He could dry pool a 170-pound bow. He was using a 115-pound bow to hunt an elephant, if I recall correctly. Mm. So, yeah, again, you know. Like you're just human beings, right? Yeah, we're just human beings, right? Yeah, I even just looked in the slide, and people in chat can see it as well. Like the visual similarities between all these um, heavy warbow pools are just, just almost identical. Um, you know, the body posture, um, the position of the shoulders. It's actually really amazing to see across time and space, I guess, how. And you're right, there's only so many ways which you can pull heavy warbow. A great, a great reference for this, uh, if you read uh, Ray Axford's Archery Anatomy, he does a pretty good analysis of, you know, like, what are the loads on the muscle groups, um, and then he sort of connects that at the end to, you know, styles of traditional archery that were practiced in the past based on their artwork. It says, like, look, this alignment, you know, it's because you're trying to get the symmetric load on the lats and the traps and rhomboids on the back. Wow, that is incredible. Uh, again, just the numbers are just absolutely uh, confounding. I just I still can't imagine. Um, I mean, like I said, from someone who only shoots target, I, I, I can barely imagine anything more than 70 pounds. But uh, yeah, 200 plus is, uh, <laughs> that is mountain levels of strength. That's incredible. Okay, um, so we are um, reaching the hour plus mark at the moment, and I think we've covered all the initial questions. We're going to give chat a uh, chance to uh, ask some questions as well. So if chat has uh, any uh, questions, feel free to drop them right now. Um, I actually have a quick question. Um, this is a, a technical one, but I'm sure a lot of people are wondering. Um, so while I've got this, this question going, uh, chat feel free to throw questions up. I've taken note of a few things already. Uh, but my question for Justin Cheers, a bit of, kind of help me out here, right? So, thumb rings. This is a thumb ring question. Uh, one of the, the great puzzles of thumb rings is getting the right size. And of course, your thumb will change and uh, you know, swell and uh, you know, shrink based on the seasons and temperature. So, what do you do when you have a thumb ring that is not quite the right size? Um... <laughs> I, I usually wrap a wrap some, some like a little bit of like tape on the inner band of the ring to make it fit a little better. Mm. Or you could put some uh, padding on the inside of the lip of the ring right. to make it fit a little better. There are some hacks that you can do there. Yeah, it's just a put something like a, you know inside of it, and uh, just yeah. wrap some like a blue tape on it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there are things that you can do. Um, that would be the the really kind of quick and dirty hack. The other thing you could do is make it a little nicer, um, like glue in some leather, some liner, or, or some just belt. get some, uh, some new ring. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, shoot, I shoot with multiple sizes of rings. Like I start my uh, workout with um, like this ring, and then like I'll transition to this ring after a few shots, which is a little smaller. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I found myself doing very similar as well. I've got a few different rings from Vermal Archery. I sent me different sizes. I wasn't sure what size I want to begin with. So I thought, oh, give me a couple of these. And uh, yeah, I found myself switching between one ring and another after a few shots as well. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just one ring. These are um, Vermal Victory thumb rings right here. Just plugging them a little bit. I sell these too. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry, obligatory. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm sure chat has favorites. Uh, I'm more of a Vilma classic myself, but Victory is a wonderful. I've got one too. I've got a green one. Uh, I need to spend more time using it, but uh, no, the thumb rings are beautiful. Uh, I mean, I, I like the, uh, the the colorful ones, but uh, what, what do you think, Justin and G? Like, do you like the, 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 the resin, plastic resin, or do you like the, the metal ones more? Well, I mean, you, you have your own customs. Right? Yeah, I have my own stuff. That's yeah. plastic. You know, I, I like both. I like both, like a metal ones, like, it's gonna last you forever. I know, so like you can shoot like a heavy bow without like thinking about it too much, you know. Yeah. For plastic, he might not be able to take that kind of weight. So, you know, it really depends on like, you know, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of weight you wanna do, uh, wanna shoot. And again, for the war bow part, like, you know, we are not like asking everybody to shoot like a, you know, 100 pound compete or something like that. You know, it's all about like, a, you know, correct like a form. Like, you know, as long as you have a correct form, like you can shoot like 100 pounds or you can just do like a 50 pound, 40 pound for recreational purpose. 
So, you know, so far the full, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I echo that sentiment as well. Like, um, well, first about the thumb ring, uh, plastic, I found that breaking at about the 60 pound mark. Oh. So anything above that, I kind of need to use metal by default. That's right. right. Um, and then for form, like the, for poundages and stuff like that, like we, like we're not the, you know, oh, if you don't shoot 180 pound bow, yeah. then you're not really an archer. Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of an unproductive kind of that's mindset. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, I'm not the kind of concern troll who says, you know, oh, you're going to blow your shoulder out if you shoot anything above 60 pounds. Yeah. You know, like, and, <laughs> And I'll tell you this, like, I, I get that from people at the range who have form that looks like this. Yeah. I'm, and I'm like, yeah, no wonder you're blowing your shoulder out at 60 pounds, because <laughs> your bow shoulder technique sucks. Yeah. Right? Mm. So, you know, the, um, it's, I, I, you have to be responsible and practice good technique at all times. Right? So that you don't hurt yourself. Number one, don't hurt yourself That's with right. your mm. technique. No, if you're doing something wrong, like with a wrong form, like you mean shooting like a 40 pound, if you shoot a lot, you, you, you can still injure yeah, yourself. Exactly. You know? So it's exactly. uh, so about like a proper form. Yeah, and, and the thing is, the, the technique the day, that. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And like the technique that lets you shoot the heavier weight, guess what? That makes your lighter weight feel even easier. That's right. It can be more comfortable. You can get more shots off under control. So, um, yeah, like there's that's that's the bridge between you know lighter weights and heavier weights. Yes. It's, the, it's good technique. Hmm, right. Okay, now I've got some uh, chat questions. Uh, we've got quite a few from chat, so we'll go through uh, a few uh, if you can. Um, so, uh, PX Charon wants to uh, know more about um, the positioning and alignment of the hips. Mm. Okay, so the. Uh, well, you, you want to take this one? Alright, so the, the hips, um, I would say. The, the angle of that. Yeah, let me see if I can get that. The hips, uh, well, let's see. Let's say the target's over here. Uh, I have a preference for a stance that's a little more oblique like this. Um, tend to, for me, at least for my purposes, I tend to keep it in line with my torso, only because I feel like that's more conducive to pulling heavier draw weights. I know there are some theories where you keep your, your hips pointed this way and your torso pointed that way in order to or ring your core like a towel to keep it stable. Mm. But that is, for me, I don't feel that, that, I think that for me that inhibits my strength for the higher draw weights. Um, as for the alignment of the lumbar spine, you know, whether you want it more like this versus more like that, um, the guy talks about keeping the full or how, how's it, how's it pronounced? Yeah, it's all just a straight body. Yeah, it's like, you know, kind of straight, straight here. Yeah. Um, you don't want to do this, you know. Yeah. Mm. You don't want to, you don't want to be like that. That's going to be like, but you don't want to be too much like yeah, this. You don't want to bend like that way. Now, now you know? um, here's a little, here's a little sort of detail in terms of anatomy as well. So you will see though, with like the really heavy weight bows, like with Mark Stretton shooting or with some of those, um, um, like the, the Japanese Hikiryu, Bishu Shikura, and Han practitioners, like they really actually, they arch their lumbar spine backwards. Well, first of all, that's because they're trying to shoot like really heavy bows, right? 170 pounds, 200 pounds, you know, 140 pounds, wherever that is. But also, um, it just so happens that the movement that brings the lumbar spine back, like that involves, um, you know, some of those back muscles, but also it involves the lower trapezius as well. And guess what? When you're pulling a bow back, you're getting your tra your traps involved in that motion. So it's sort of like one of those compatible movements that helps you, you know, eke out just a little bit more strength yeah. for the 140, 170, 200 pound weight range. But it it won't make your lower back sore. So you kind of have to weigh the, the trade offs on that. And I think it's better. It's um, for most people. It's probably better. It's better to just kind of keep that lumbar spine straight for balance and for comfort. Good, thank you. Um, we've got another question. This is from David Novak. Uh, now, this is a, a slightly curious one because uh, this obviously wouldn't be done in traditional Chinese archery, but he wants to know about um, advice on how to shoot a smaller bow from a wheelchair. Like, what advice would you have for someone who's sitting down or sitting in a wheelchair? Hmm. Let's see. Um, yeah, let's, uh, well, let's, let's simulate. Um, Maybe like a first of all, get a shot at both, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry, I haven't, this is a, this is kind of a very interesting question as well, because I think, 
I can't really see it. Sorry. I think this well, I, oh, my my Jerry setup is blocking things. But <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, I think for sure no, it's 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 fine. Um, like if you're sitting, yeah, if your bow is too long, obviously it's not. It's gonna you know smash against the ground. Um, yeah, you definitely don't want that. Okay, so <laughs> I'll share a story, kind of a blooper story. Um, my early days, like I was like trying to practice sitting down, but I didn't account for the fact that my bow was a little too long. <laughs> so the whole limb hit the ground and the whole thing came unstrung. So that's you definitely want to avoid that yeah. if possible. Um, a bow that's shorter would be good because um, you don't want it to hit your chair. Um, the and but also maybe you want to um, you can make. <laughs> Sort of shorter in profile by canting the bow as well. Yeah. Right. If you cant the bow, that may brought buy you a little extra um, height room as well. There's that. There's that aspect of it. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, uh, sitting in a chair. Well, you know that, that's almost like uh, being on a horse. Yeah. In terms of you know, well, uh, although on a horse you're you're actually kind of standing up on the stirrups a little bit to shoot. But you, know, you can imagine if you were trying to turn here. Then yeah, shorter bow, maybe a little bit of canting that could help. That's right. Sorry, I haven't put too much deep thought into that mm -hmm. question, but maybe that might give some ideas. But always think about it before release. See, like if that limb is gonna hit your chair or hit your. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, interesting. Okay, uh, next question comes from James. Um, does Gao Ying make a distinction between instinctive shooting and gap shooting, and what? How do you aim? For me, I do like an instinctive shooting. Like you know, I can say that. So, what Gai's words were, um, you know, your your vision is on the target, and that the arrow, um, the arrow head, and the shaft are in the, are viewed from the corner of your eye. That is in your peripheral vision, yeah. and you sort of imagine a line to the target. Um, one could argue that could be instinctive shooting, or that could be maybe split vision shooting, yeah. which is you know you have your focus on the target, but then your arrow is in the fuzzy, it's in your fuzzy vision. That's right. Um, and so it's not quite gap. Gap. My understanding of that is that the um, the handle or the arrow point is in your focal vision. The target is fuzzy. Mm. And so that uh, Gaian doesn't talk about gap so much. What he talks about is more along the lines of something that's instinctive or at the most or or split vision. Yeah, for him, like yeah. I, I think, like for close range, like a forty anything within forty meters, that that would be like an instinctive shooting uh, for sure. Because you know, shooting heavy bows, that was just right down. Mm. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's that's another thing. Um, he said he would also say that within a certain range, um, you're looking over the left edge of your bow, right. but then over a certain range, you're um, in front you're gonna, of the yeah, you're gonna look under your bow. Right. So that it's um, is it instinctive or gap? It's it's a little more towards the instinctive end of the spectrum. Yep. Let's say the style of aiming. And as yes. for um, you know, Jay, Jay is a very good instinctive shooter. I'm a little more on the split vision side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of our personal preference. But you know, we're that's something we're you know, I, at least I continue to explore. That's right. I suppose uh, to add to that, I guess, because Gao Ying is writing from a military point of view, um, whereas gap shooting is more of a target kind of thing, we're trying to shoot at a static target and you have predictable gaps. It makes more sense to uh, have a more practical, instinctive method. Yeah, I mean, instinctive, you know, is by far the most versatile method once you master it. The problem is that you have to master yeah. it. You have to press <laughs> it. takes some time to, to master it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, now, David has another question. This is a, a nice one too. So, traditional arrows uh, are they made from a from a standard wood or are they made from bam bamboo? Ooh, ooh. Um, let me um, let me get some props on that. This may take a few seconds, but maybe we can take the next question while I go fetch those props. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, that was the last question actually. But since we're here. Um, yeah. We, we have a, a different question. This is from Leo. I think he's asking me this question, but I suppose this has a similarity to, to um, Chinese archery as well. Um, string slap. Okay, that's a big problem with uh, Western archery especially. Um, we tend to smack our forearms. Is this a problem with Chinese archery, and how do we go about solving it? 
No, not at all. I think like for some beginners, they have this uh, problem. Like uh, you know, I had a problem before. Like you know, when I uh, got started at the beginning too. But uh, now, like you know, I don't wear anything. Like, you know, just uh, you know, just shoot. Cause you know, we have the as well we mentioned, we have this angle here, mm. and also like you know, um, you know, sometimes like if you bend your waist, uh, like a uh, hand a little bit, it might slap your hand. So that's why you have to concentrate, make sure your 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 both uh. whole arm is like straight and with this angle. And once you do this, you will never slap your arm. You don't need it. But uh, you know, just for the peace of mind, like for beginners, I suggest you to wear some like arm guard, right. so you don't have to think about it too much. And once you like, you know, uh, during the practice, and let's say like after several months of practice, I know you don't feel anything slap your arm. You can just like get rid of it and just you know try it out without like arm guard. Mm. So, so I, I I say like my my answer to this question is like you know, uh, it will be hundred percent safe to shoot like without arm guard. It will never like uh, slap you or like an arm if you have a proper form. Yeah, I found that too with shooting Asiatic. Like you know, yeah, this the alignment, the body alignment prevents a string slap. I find I've I've only slapped myself when I've leaned backwards or I've gripped the bow incorrectly. So I, I bring the string into the arm. That's kind of my fault. <laughs> you know, for beginners, like you know, uh, two things. Like right? one thing is you don't want to shoot this way right. because it's gonna kind of slap you. Yep. And uh, you know, you have a canted bow, and like you know, uh, and I have this angle here. You won't shoot uh, slap you. Arm. And also, like you know, make sure your whole arm like is straight. You don't want to bend your uh, your hand like this. If you bend your hand like this, it's yes. gonna slap you. Oh, yeah. Always make sure like, straight, sticking up. Oh yeah, I want to add. Um, as paradoxical as it sounds, you know, in our style, we count the bow this way, mm. and yet we put the arrow on that side as well. Right? See that? You know, and I can you can move up and down. Yep. Do all those kinds of fun things with the bow. You could even pull it like this if you wanted to. The key is that the uh, index finger on the draw hand side keeps it from falling. Mm, that's right. Yeah. So, um, sorry, it was. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was only able to get like a, a bamboo arrow from from my collection in time. Um, yeah, like the, the Chinese, they used uh, wood arrows in the north, especially. Yeah. And uh, in the south, they tended to use bamboo arrows. That's yeah. uh, you know. In, in the north part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no bamboo in the north. So yeah. here's, here's what's, what's available. So uh, this is an arrow made by Yap Kopadrayer, um, you know, our friend who uh, co-organizes and also who hosts the Chinese archery program uh, each year. And uh, he grows the bamboo on his farm. So these, like, literally grow out of the ground like this. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, well, not, not, not completely fleshed, but... Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to do some, like, hand straightening and... Yeah, you know, a lot of work on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. then, you, then you put the feathers on. Um, but yeah, we can do a close up here. So um, this is a. Hmm, the focus is a little. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Yeah, so this is a bamboo arrow. Um, Southern Chinese would definitely be using bamboo. Yep. And then uh, in the north, yeah, they, they would prefer wood. Um, the. Oh, actually, sorry. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to run up and get a... I actually have a, a wood arrow from the Qing Dynasty oh, yeah? that I can kind of show here. Um, I'll be back. Is there any other questions? No, 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 no there'll be questions. more questions. Uh, we've got a good time. Don't worry. Okay, so uh, <laughs> while, while Justin's grabbing his arrow, uh, we'll, we'll pick up our next question. Uh, I'm just going to go back to uh, Leo for a bit there. So we just spent a moment talking about string slap. Um, now, I, I, I was just assuming you're learning Western archery, but I just thought it'd be similarities in um, Chinese archery as well. But if you are doing um, Western-style shooting with a recurve bow and you're slapping your arm, arm guard is one big thing. But uh, the same tips are there. Watch for your bow grip. Uh, your bow grip might be uh, bent on the hand and therefore you bring the string into your forearm. Um, the other advice is also uh, watch out for your elbow. Um, the elbow rotation is very important. So if your elbow is bent inwards, the string is going to cut across your elbow. So depending on where you're hitting your arm, that will diagnose the problem. Is there a similar problem, G, in uh, Chinese archery? Um, do, do you have um, elbow rotation problems in uh, Chinese archery? Uh Elbow rotation problem? Um, what do you mean by elbow rotation yeah, problem? Yeah, so uh, one of the common problems with Western uh, recurve I mean, for beginners is they'll naturally bend their elbow inwards and the string cuts across the uh, the elbow joint. Is there a similar That's problem with learners of Chinese archery? Yeah, like if they're double jointed. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah um, 
Yeah, it, it definitely. It seems to be universal yeah. across archery yeah. styles. Um, yeah, and I think you just have to, you know, yeah, just rotate like your elbow a little bit more. Yeah, like this. in order to get that the you yeah, know, double medial jointed is, uh, It's kind of uh, pending. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. Yeah, yeah it's, with double jointedness. Um, well, first of all, I mean, most people should be able to do a medial rotation of their elbow, mm -hmm. right? And that's actually a good thing because that's compatible with settling your bow shoulder down. Right, the muscles involved mm -hmm. in medial rotation include the lats and uh, some of the pecs. Guess what? Those are also involved in depressing the scapula uh, on your on your bow, bow shoulder side. So that, those two movements are compatible, very good for you know, um, you know most people to use. Um, if you're double jointed, then you have to really you know try to you know do that medial rotation. But Gauguin pointed out a specific case where if you are like really double jointed, then instead you probably want to do a lateral rotation of your elbow where the cup of your elbow is pointing up in order to get your yeah. arm out of the way. And you can imagine that like the arm angle of that person is going to be like up there. That's right. Like, mm -hmm. kind of, it's, going to look, it's going to look very, uh, like just imagine like the upper arm is like that, but the forearm is like that. Yeah. Kind of like shh. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, like yeah. Case, right? That's an extreme case. That's an extreme case. And I, I don't think I've encountered anyone like that. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, so for comparison, a wooden arrow, antique. Um, this is a Qing Dynasty. Yeah, Qing Dynasty arrow right here. Um, and you know it's got a nice kind of barrel thickening in the center, thinning out at both ends. Um, this is a Qing Dynasty arrow. So the Manchu bow meant for a very long draw. You know, arrows could be as long as like 36 inches or one meter. Like way longer than what I need <laughs> for my for my own archery, but um, yeah, you know, and but most of the Qing Dynasty arrows, you would see them made of uh, made of wood because, well, you know, the Manchus they lived in the north. So, hmm. yeah, I think we've got a few uh, last questions. We didn't chat to really answer, but we'll address them now anyway. So one comes from Charles. Uh, so when you're aiming. Should you see the string in your peripheral vision, and if so, how does it? How should it affect your aiming? I think I draw too long to yeah, see. Yeah, the, yeah. The oh, I don't yeah. see. No, I don't see the string. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought so. That's more of a Western thing. A uh, string picture you see in your vision, the corner of your eye. But if you're drawing past your eye, you're not going to see that at all. So all you all you see is the target and you know the arrow, I guess. Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and this was also covered already too, but uh, since Rick is just joined, joined us, uh, so Ricky's question is, uh, can you use a shorter arrow or uh, anchor shorter on the cheek um, with the Gaoyun technique? Hmm. Let me see. Um, I think it, um, I'm just going to you know, like, go like this, right? I'm trying to tilt here. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, it's better to, like, if you want to do Gaoyun style, like, I think, you know, it's better to, like, draw around the air. Mm. Like I have a medium draw, cause that's uh, you know as what we talked before. This is considered like a short draw, like a Turkish people do that. Yeah, here, exactly. here's the thing. I know of um, like champion longbow archers who um, who have used the long the Gaoyin technique for their form, even though they're doing a shorter draw. I mean, because the other principles apply, like like yeah. you know settle the bow shoulder a certain way, you know use do a kind of a pushing down draw in order to, yeah. to do the draw so that you can use the traps, rhomboids and lats. Um, and, you know, if you just stop at a shorter draw length, that's cool. Like, that's that's totally cool. Um, to practice the style, though, for heavier draw weights, uh, it is a little easier to handle higher draw weights when you're, you've got a little more uh, of a longer draw because then, you know, there isn't as much torque on the uh, shoulder joints when you reach your full draw. So that's the advantage of drawing a little longer like that. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Now, of course, the yeah, point being is that if you're learning Asiatic or thumb draw, there are many different variations. Uh, that question was specific for Turkish draw. Uh, you don't have to follow a particular style when doing thumb draws. I mean, once you find out you know, what you're comfortable with and you know, if you're following sure. a particular method, then um, that's when uh, these things probably suit and they're refined for the context they're in, the bows, the um, the military context. So there's no one style fits all. So if you're shooting short draw of Turkish, shoot short draw of Turkish. If you're doing Gaoying, then 
you know, long or draw Gao Ying is kind of what's prescribed. So there's flexibility, I guess. Uh, you agree with that? So there's no like one correct way of doing any form of Asiatic sure. archery. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely context dependent. Or if you're doing the, uh, you know, the Manchu style, you're yeah. drawing it longer because oh. you're trying to, you're trying to repel yeah. this spear, this miniature spear, you know, <laughs> yeah. towards your target. Um, yeah, like it, it really depends on what, you know, what's the arrow that you're trying to propel your target? What's your goal in the end? That's right. Hmm. Speaking of that, that spear you're holding, Justin, um, yeah, yeah. And this is a, a more of a comment than a question, but uh, from PX Charon, that the, the length of that fletching is insane. And my question is why? Um, just to keep it stable. No, like in Gaian's book, he was talking about like if you're shooting like a super heavy bow, and uh, uh, so like the arrow weight is super heavy, you might want to use like a you know, long fletching. If you shoot like a lighter bow, or maybe like the arrow weight is super light, you want to shoot like a, a shorter like a fletching. So it, it right. depends. For Manchurian, like they shoot like a, you know, heavy, long. Like they're also the, the, the Manchu, the, the Qing Dynasty Manchu tactics, they're, it's more geared towards, um, Riding really fast on a horse, getting close to your enemy, and shooting with a really heavy bow and a really heavy arrow, yeah. you need it to stabilize like at close range. You don't need it to travel, yeah. you know, hundred or four hundred fifty yeah. meters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Shooting fifty meters and in was like acceptable and yeah. quite sufficient for them to achieve their objectives. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, speaking of heavy war bows, uh, this is from Richard. Uh, Richard shoots a um, 110 pound bow, amazing already, um, with, a, with, a, with a three finger draw. He's wondering how long would it take to uh, condition the thumb to shooting heavy draw weights? Sure you do. Yeah. It, it, it will it'll no, take some time. I would give it maybe. No, I think it would take some time even for, like, you know, when you get started, even to, it would take some time for you to shoot, like, a slightly lighter bow, too. Because, you know, for some draw, some people, like, at the beginning, they bend their thumb a lot. Uh -huh. So, you know, this is why education, like, you know, if you, after shooting a while, like, you feel like your thumb is getting super wide, and that's not a good sign. Because you don't want your drawing to take too much tension. Hmm. You know, the whole point is, like, have a relaxed, like, you know, thumb, like a bended relax. And, uh, you know, have the weight, like have your hand, this part of, uh, like, you know, muscle to take the weight instead of having your joint to, like, take the weight, you know. So I thought we can do that, like, you know, heavy weight won't be a no problem, right? Yeah, well, 110 pounds, no joke, right? So yeah. you want to definitely not jump too high too that's fast because right. that's going to hurt your tendon as well. So here's the thing, like, what I found when I jumped from, um, say, like, 90 pounds to 100 pounds, just with thumb draw, like, left-handed, I felt more of a stretching kind of sensation in the tendon along here. And then eventually that sensation went away after like training like that for like two, three, four weeks. Cause you have to acclimate the tendon. You know, you have to put a little bit of load on tendon to make it stronger, right? If you don't put any load on it, the tendon gets weaker. Yeah. Put too much load on it, it breaks, right? That's right. So um, I would say if you want to train up your thumb, to shoot 110 pounds. A lighter. Yeah, like, and if you haven't done thumb draw at all before, yeah, start with a lighter bow, then go up in increments until you reach your, because that, that tendon needs to be trained. You know, your back might be able to handle the weight, but you have these tendons, these connectors that you have to train up as well. That's right. Yeah, even I found shooting a, a forty pound, uh, you know, thumb draw that 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 the ouch after a week, you know, you 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 you're fine on the day, but after uh, you go home, like oh, ow, that that's a little, a little sore. Yeah. It takes time to get used to uh, yeah. uh, the load. And yeah, one more suggestion is like, uh, uh, I suggest you guys don't use like leather ring too much. Like uh, you know, no. at the beginning we were all using like you know leather rings, but even for like lighter poundage, like a forty pound. You know, if you shoot a lot, it's gonna hurt your a joint. Yeah. Like you know. That, that's so what just, I uh, found actually. I I got the thumb pain from using a leather tab. That's what I found. So when I used the uh, the plastic or the uh, the metal rings, there was no problem yeah. with that. But the leather ones actually caused me problems. That's right. Yeah. So just definitely, no matter what kind of weight you start, you just shoot it with a, a hard ring. Mm. You know. Yeah. And I would add, you know, Mark Stratton, you know, the English warbow archer who holds the Guinness Book of World Records for tuning, shooting a two hundred pound longbow. Um, he also recommends training up the tendons as well, right? right. That's, 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 you can't, you can't avoid it, right? Like if, if that's your weakest link, then, you know, you have to train it. Yeah, that so. makes a lot of sense, actually. 
Um, all right, I think we'll wrap it up very quickly. I think some last couple of questions. And again, if you're gonna flood chat now with questions, do it right now. But uh, I think we'll finish up in around 10 minutes or so. Um, so, question from Erwin. Uh, we know, we know Erwin. Okay, so Erwin says while reading Gao Ying, um, he doesn't specifically, or he didn't see a mention on stance. From what he understands, the proper stance is what us modern archers call an open stance. Is that correct? Open stance. Yeah, open stance would be like yeah. uh, four to five degree stance. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, some people do like open stance. Like he was talking about open stance, but you know, again, like as what he mentioned in the book, like you know, imagine you're doing like horseback archery. Stance don't matter that True. much. Like you know, so it's it's so about like you know, find your, you know, best like you know, a best stance like that fits you. Make sure like you you are, you feel like comfortable. Like you know, that's that's the whole point of a stance. You know. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, if you look at some of the main paintings, there's another type of stance that's advocated, which is more like um, what they call like a, a backward stance yeah. or a closed stance, where like the back yeah. leg is kind of uh, back yeah. like this. That's right. Yeah. And this is sometimes something we do sometimes for beginners to introduce them to, you know, tucking that shoulder blade back down that's and towards right. the back as well. No, I think about yeah. like you know when you like you know shoot backwards, you feel more back tension mm. like. In so, you know, that's the whole point of, like, you know, the whole back stance. You know, beginners, they can start with that, like, you know, just feel the back tension, the, the draw side, like, the back tension a little bit. So that's a good way. And uh, But, you know, you can shoot, still shoot, like, an like, open stance. And even, like, uh, straight, like, you know, uh, to the targets, it's, it's all right. Like, you know, at least from my point of view, like, you know, um, stance do, don't matter too much. You know, you have to find one, like, it really fits you, you know. That's, yeah. that's a whole point of stance. Yeah, we're a little stance agnostic, just as long as you, you know, pick one and you're not doing anything too crazy. Yep. That's right. That's <laughs> like this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, question from Michael. Uh, what are some exercises to help strengthen uh, back muscles? Shoot, shoot a bow. Yeah, shoot a bow. <laughs> because strength strength is very activity specific. Mm. You that's know, right. like I've, I've tried that thing where I go to the gym and I do cable rows and all that stuff, and I, was, I didn't get any stronger. Because, you know, your, your brain has to adapt to the fact that as you pull, that weight gets heavier. And then you have to, yeah. like, pull the least as well. Yeah. If you just take a, you know, dry pulling a bow, like, you know, drawing it, letting it down, that's okay, but you're training yourself to draw and let down, right? Mm -hmm. So you just shoot I mean, a bow. You're doing, like, you know, if you shoot a heavy bow, you're doing, like, a shooting both sides, right? At uh, least, like, a draw, like, size to make it better. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, if... if and you're on your offside, so like if you're a right-handed archer and you want to train your left-hand side, you could you could do drive pulls, and that's how I started. But then I was like, you know, maybe I should actually shoot right. shoot left-handed yeah. as well. And I actually got this advice from um, from uh, Yap. He would say that um, some of the strongest flight archers of the modern era, and we're talking like um, people who weighed like, no more than 120 pounds, and they're shooting. I don't know, even lighter than that. Like you know, there's a Archer uh, April Moon, small woman. Yeah, she was able to shoot a 120 pound flight bow. Yeah. And uh, the the way that she got stronger was, you know, she shoot did. one, shoot, train with the right hand side, and then train with the left hand and side. Also, her daily job was like pressing like a certain stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah so like were, a, she definitely got a very strong forearm and stuff like that. Right, right. I mean, it was um, her. Um, I think Don Brown was also a disciple of Harry Drake as well. Harry Drake is another. You know, all those people, uh, Harry Drake, April Moon, Don Brown, like legends in the flight archery field, and um, their philosophy on training, because they, they were able to shoot like really heavy bows too, and their philosophy with training was shoot your normal side, also train the other side as well. Yeah, just make it balance. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a good way. Hmm. But they, they actually recommended asymmetric, where like this lighter on the left-hand side, heavier on your right-hand side, mm -hmm. that's your normal side. But I actually sort of take it a step further. I just want to be able to shoot the same weight on both sides if yeah. possible. And of course, with the uh, Asiatic bows, they are ambidextrous, so you can do both sides with one bow. Yeah, pretty much. Like, it's uh, pick your side, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. I think we have one more question, and this is quite early on. This is from Lisa, way, way back in the stream. Um, so, you're based in the, the States, of course. Now, for someone based in Europe, uh, what, what, are, you know, uh, what are some schools or places you can learn um, Asiatic or Chinese archery? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, we have to we have to get that list up. Um, so if we will update this. Uh, yeah, we have, we got to update that part of section of our site. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, first of all, you know, you could uh, there's an annual Eastern Archery Program held this year. I think it's either end of August or beginning of September. You got to check that. Um, it's organized by uh, my reselling partner in Europe, Stefan Kosiador, and um, they they basically have a you know a rigorous training program that. We'll take you through all the steps of the thumb draw and all the technique. Some like yeah. uh, cap like alumni will attend. Too. Exactly, yeah. Some Chinese archery program alumni. We have them in uh, the Netherlands, in Belgium, um, and in Sweden as well. So that's right. Uh, Sweden and any other places. I think. That's it. That's all right. I think of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we gotta we gotta update our that section of our site. But there are people who practice uh, the Gaoying style in Europe. And are are quite good with that too. That's right. Yep. So I've I've brought up the uh the the outdated list. You've got the uh list for uh, Western and Eastern USA, of course, uh and Canada. And there's a place in Melbourne. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Owen and Christine came from Melbourne to uh, Georgia one year. That was quite a trek for them. And. Uh, you know, I think uh, if you have a chance, you know, look them up. That's right. Yeah, how, how do I not know this? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. Uh, it's been actually really amazing because, uh, like, we've, uh, I've, I've, I've had a few people bring um, Chinese bows and they've read Gao Ying, um, you know, years back to my club. And this is before I, you know, started doing Asiatic archery. So uh, one of the things I, uh, I'm actually really happy with is, um, you know, when, when I run my beginner line, um, I don't bring my Olympic bow. That's so I always shoot that. But when I run the line, I bring a Mongolian bow or a, a Chinese bow and use that instead. Just to, like, dazzle the uh, the newbies, just seeing, like, green arrow and stuff. And just think they've never seen an Asiatic bow before. So it's been great fun to meet people who shoot different styles. And um, it's just it's so exciting to... Um, be exposed to that as well um yeah so um i guess we'll we'll wrap it up are there any final things to say about uh or anything really about uh gao ying or chinese archery or any anything you want to say what do you want to say uh, concluding thoughts um well um no i mean of well, it's like we consider Chinese archery practice like, you know, as a lifetime practice, right? Yes. So it's all about like, you know, compete with yourself, like what Confucius said. Mm. You know, as long as you can like, you know, improve step by step and uh, like, you know, um, be better you every day, that's good enough, you know? So that's all, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the results, the prizes, whatever, um, that's, but that's, that's all just a reflection of the process that you work on from a day-to-day -day basis, right? Because archery, and part of why archery held such a high place in Chinese culture is because it was a metaphor for um, self-improvement right. and refinement. Right? There's an old Chinese expression, "shi yi guan de." Through archery, you can see a person's virtue because the way that you 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 know try to get yourself um, closer to the target is not just fixing on target. It's about improving, you know, how you do things, improving your mental outlook on things as well. And if you and it's a never-ending journey, like. I keep learning things day by day. Yeah, we are still doing practice. that. Yeah. It's competing, like, you know, yourself instead of others, you know. Yeah. And that was an absolutely amazing quote to end with. That's everybody's Facebook profile picture from now on. So um, that's uh, an amazing <laughs> little philosophy. And I do agree. There's, there's so much you can learn through yourself by doing archery in, in any form. So uh, I guess we'll be ending our stream there. Um, it's been fantastic to have uh, Justin and Jia on board. Uh, this has perhaps been the best uh, live stream we've ever done. Uh, just having our guests and having so many perspectives. It, uh, I mean, from my end, I know um, Justin and Jia can't see it, but from my end, from your end watching, it just looks absolutely amazing to see everything on screen. Um, it's been great having uh, chat up as well. Uh, you guys have been fantastic in asking questions. And a lot of alumni are kind of really chipping in, helping you out too. So it's been absolutely amazing to bring everyone together again. Um, again, it's thanks to uh, Justin Jia. Uh, I really should be plugging their channel. Um, you guys have been doing a lot of, uh, well, starting to do some video topics um, to complement um, you know, Gao Ying and the book and so on. So definitely check out their channel. We'll be linking stuff in the description if it's already there. 
Um, and yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, thanks to everyone for being involved and a special big thank you for Justin and Gia for spending their time um, to share their perspective and their experience of Archer with us. Um, yeah, so uh, again, yeah. It's been a real, uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much. All right, guys, thanks a lot, and hopefully we'll see you around next time. All right. All right. Later. See ya.